Hello and welcome to our week 4 supplemental lecture on Max Weber's Science as a Vocation. We met Weber last week in our common lecture on classical social and economic theorists, particularly in relation to his theory that capitalism has exceptionally ascetic qualities and his attempt to explain that asceticism by looking at ascetic religious beliefs and what role they might have played in the formation of the system. This week we're taking a look at a talk he gave that was meant to talk about science as a vocation. It starts off with him giving advice to essentially graduate students or people thinking about graduate study about what they'd be in for if they go into science as a career, and the advice isn't all that dissimilar to what someone might tell a prospective PhD student today, but quite quickly it becomes a series of reflections on what science is, what it can do, what it can't do, in ways that are reflective of some of the conceptions of science, and particularly science as a force that undermines meaning. So we'll take a look at this text and uh, see what we can unpack from it. So he starts off in a space that's, again, not all that dissimilar to Connell uh, from week one, where Connell is talking about the professionalization of sociology and its institutionalization in universities in the US. Weber is commenting at the beginning of this piece on a transition within the German university system, which has had a very different model to the kind of professionalized academic department sort of model that Connell is discussing in her piece. Weber says, the technical benefits are beyond a doubt, as in all capitalist and bureaucratized organizations, but the spirit that prevails in them is different from the atmosphere that has been historically prevailed at German universities. So the universities are in a period of transition. The nature of that transition is something that he's going to then analyze through this piece. Uh, he talks about the role of chance in the career as an academic, the fact that, yes, you need talent, yes, you need work, but your ability to actually gain a place in the profession is subject to a variety of things that are really beyond anyone's control that mean that the person with the most talent doesn't necessarily end up with a place or with the best place. And while this is specific to an argument about academia, it's also consistent with things that Weber will argue in other places about the way in which the kind of rationalization that goes together with bureaucratization leaves room for elements that are not terribly rational, like chance, like charisma. He also talks about what he calls the aristocratic spirit of science, and this is something that will re-emerge in debates over the status of science in the current period. He says, democracy has its place, but the scientific training that is traditional in German universities, which we should be providing, is a matter of aristocratic spirit, and we should face up to this. On the other hand, it is also undoubtedly true that the presentation of scientific problems in such a way that an untrained but receptive mind can understand them and, crucially, go on to think about them independently is perhaps the most difficult pedagogic task of all. Mastery of this art is a personal gift and by no means necessarily coincides with the scientific abilities of a scholar. This is something that plays out in the press, the obligation of, for example, the scientists who work on climate change or on any other kind of controversial area where science is impinging on public policy. The expectation that they will, as scientists, have the gift to make their conclusions and the basis for their conclusions accessible to people who don't have the training, and a criticism of the aristocratic spirit of science in a democratic society where people want to be able to make decisions over the course of their affairs. And this is a tension that persists. It's not something that's specific to Weber's time. He talks about specialization being one of the key elements of the transition that he's talking about within science. And specialization has already, at the point that he's writing, gotten to the level that it has become difficult to cross, he says, even into neighboring fields, even into fields that are quite closely related. He says, only through rigorous specialization can the scientific work worker truly gain the feeling of satisfaction for the first and perhaps the only time in his life of being able to say, here I have achieved something that will last. Today, a really final and proficient achievement 
is always a specialist achievement. Okay, so you're not going to be doing grand systems like someone like Kant or Hegel or sort of these early thinkers might have done. You're going to make a very specific, very small contribution in a highly specialized field. And that enables progress. Habermas talks about this in the piece of his in week two. It enables a great deal of progress, but it also makes it more difficult to communicate the nature and the basis of that progress to people who aren't in a specialized area. Today, a really final and proficient achievement is always a specialist achievement. And anyone who does not have the ability to put on blinkers, as it were, and to enter into the idea that the destiny of his soul depends on his being right about this particular conjectural imitation at this point in this manuscript, should stay well away from science. Okay, the days of grand system building, of being able to say something about all aspects of human knowledge or even all aspects of a particular discipline are gone. Things have become too complicated, we know too much, and what you can have an impact on is actually quite small. At the same time, it's not enough just to plod along. You have to have a level of inspiration. Methodical work lays the foundation for that inspiration to be able to do any good. So he says the amateur differs from the expert only in that he lacks a firm and secure working method. So method stays part of the self-conception of science. It's not something that goes away or becomes outdated, that Bacon thought was important but that we've moved away from. But Weber also talks about a kind of intoxication or mania. And he says it's not all that dissimilar to the kind of brilliance and insight you might see in a business person or in an artist. Okay, so inspiration is part of the process as well. But there's something different about the kind of inspiration and intoxication and mania that's involved in science for Weber. And that difference is what the inspiration is directed toward. He says, it is harnessed to the course of progress. And progress is a very specific kind of purpose, and he starts to unpack that. He says, a work of art that attains real fulfillment will never be surpassed and will never become obsolete. So you can gain a sort of true immortality through producing your work of art that is of surpassing skill. By contrast, he says, every one of us who works in science knows that what he has produced will be obsolete in 10, 20, or 50 years. That is the fate, indeed the meaning, of scientific work to which it is dedicated and devoted in a quite specific sense, unlike all otherwise comparable cultural elements. Every scientific fulfillment means new questions and is intended to be surpassed and rendered obsolete. Everyone who wants to serve science has to come to terms with this. It is not only the fate, but also the goal of all of us to be surpassed scientifically. We cannot work without hoping that others will get farther than we have. In principle, this progress can go on indefinitely. And then he asks why anyone would do such a thing, and what, what sort of weird motivation leads people to want to contribute something that they know isn't going to be a final contribution, specifically in order to set up for people to be able to overturn their contribution in the not-too-distant future. He says, why pursue something that in reality never comes to an end and never can? There's no logical end point. There's no finished product. Science just goes on and on and on and on and on. And he uses a term that's going to become very influential and that you'll see other people use not only when they're talking about science, but when they're talking about broader topics in social and political theory. He calls it disenchantment. Okay, And he's going to analyze what it means to talk about the world becoming disenchanted. So he says, if we're talking about scientific progress, what kind of claim are we actually making? Are we saying that all scientists or all people or all scientists of a particular sort knows more than people in a pre-scientific period. And he says, hardly. Those of us who travel by streetcar, unless we're physicists, have no notion of how the streetcar works or what sets it in motion, and there's no need to know either. All we need to know is that we can depend on it to behave in a certain way and can act accordingly. But as to how a streetcar is built so that it will move of that we know nothing. The savage, he says, knows incomparably more about his tools. 
the savage knows how to obtain his food for the day, and knows which institutions enable him to do this. Thus, increasing intellectualization and rationalization does not mean increasing general knowledge of the conditions under which we live our lives. It's quite interesting. Okay, so there's nothing individually more knowledgeable about the scientist. We don't have day-to-day -day living skills that are more advanced than people in earlier times. We might live more comfortably because of the technologies that we have around us, but we actually may know much, much less about those technologies. We certain could, cer certainly couldn't individually reproduce all of them if we had to. We rely heavily on things that other people know and do, and it may be quite difficult to find an individual with sufficient knowledge to reproduce even one of these kinds of technologies by themselves. Okay? Whereas in a previous society, people might have plausibly been able, even if some were better than others at certain things, to reproduce most of the things that they needed as conditions of their existence for their time. So when we're talking about progress, we're not talking about the progress of the individual or the development of a person who is more knowledgeable or who knows more about the conditions of their life. He says it means something else, that if we only wanted to, we could learn at any time that there are, in principle, no mysterious, unpredictable forces in play, but that all things, in principle, can be controlled through calculation. This, however, means the disenchantment of the world. Okay? So we don't think anything works by magic. Okay? We don't know what makes a streetcar run, but we don't think there's someone waving a magic wand and making it go, we think that in principle, if we took enough time and we studied it, we could figure it out. It would be a technical problem we could teach ourselves, and with the right resources, we could construct a streetcar ourselves. So what's distinctive about scientific progress for Weber isn't the impact it has on individual knowledge or cognition, but a change in the belief system, a change in the belief structure, so that we think that in principle, there's nothing magical driving what's in our everyday world. And then he says, so what are the implications of this kind of disenchantment for what we think of about the meaning of life? And he talks about Tolstoy. And he refers to a passage where Tolstoy is addressing the question of whether death is meaningful. And Tolstoy concludes that it is not meaningful for civilized people because they exist in an infinite line of progress that doesn't culminate in any end point. So meaning here is connected to having some telos, some end point, uh, toward which things are headed, so we can judge meaning against that telos. And Weber says, Abraham, like any peasant in ancient times, died old and fulfilled by life because he had lived in the organic cycle of life, because in accordance with its purpose, in the evenings of his days, his life had brought him what it had to offer and because no puzzling questions remained unanswered, and he could therefore be content. A civilized man, however, placed in the continual process of the enrichment of civilization with ideas, knowledge, and problems, can become weary of life, but not fulfilled by it, for he can snatch only the tiniest part, and always only that which is transient, nothing final, of what the life of his mind constantly gives birth to, and consequently death for him is a meaningless event. And because death is meaningless, civilized life is meaningless too, as through its meaningless attachment to progressiveness, it brands death as meaningless. So this is Tolstoy. But Weber sort of endorsing the general sentiment here. So if life had a boundedness to it, if there was a certain amount it had to offer, then you would have a sense of what it would mean to have done everything that could be done with a life. And so your life could come to a conclusion, it could be complete, it could be fulfilled, and then death would have the meaning of marking the end of that fulfillment. But we have a continuum of history that we perceive ourselves to live within that stretches on and on and on. And there's no in-principle limit to the stuff that could happen, the new things that we could learn, the directions that history could go. And so there's no way for us to attain that same sense of having been exposed to everything life has to offer. We have this feeling that life will offer new things in the future that we couldn't even imagine now and that we're going to miss if we die. We're not going to be able to experience. 
And then Weber talks about the great hope that's placed in science and in knowledge and in the progress of knowledge. And he goes all the way back to Greek antiquity. And the ironic culmination of this process of hoping and trying to develop science and trying to progress, culminating in a society of meaninglessness. He says, and today, who still believes that the insights of astronomy or biology or physics or chemistry could teach us anything about the meaning of the world if one exists? If anything, they're more likely to destroy the roots of any belief that anything like a meaning of the world exists at all. And finally, science, the power that is alienated from God as the path to God. He's thinking about the expectation uh, of the sort of classical scientific text that we've read, that by the study of nature you would see the mind of God, you would reach God, and Weber's just incredulous that someone would have this hope. Today, he says, no one, whether he admits it or not, is in any doubt in his innermost being that it is indeed alienated from God. Okay? Now, obviously, not everybody's going to agree with this, but Weber's putting a strong claim here on science as a process that is undermining of meaning, that is intrinsically relativizing, uh, and that is something that is anti-religious in its implications. And then he talks about romanticism as a response to this and specifically brings up Nietzsche in this context. And obviously you can think back on the Nietzsche passage that we took a look at last week and think about it in relation to this, the passage about the madman who talks about how we've killed God. And Weber's got a similar thing in mind. And then he starts talking about science as being something that can be very rational about the means to solve a given problem, but he's not good at setting endpoints or problems itself. And this is a distinction, means and rationality. It's popped up in the Strauss last week as the, as the fact-value distinction. Um, but it's a common conception of what modern science is good at, that it's very, very good at sort of technical solutions, but it doesn't actually have anything to give when it comes to deciding what we ought to do collectively or individually with our lives. Weber says, science presupposes the validity of logic and method. Okay, so he talks about science calling itself presuppositionless, uh, calling itself something that doesn't rely on kind of mystical assumptions or ungrounded kind of metaphysics, but he says it does presuppose some things. The validity of logic and method, but also he says that the products of scientific work are important in the sense of being worth knowing. And he says, it's here that our problems begin, for this presupposition itself cannot be demonstrated by scientific means. It can only be interpreted to determine its ultimate meaning, which can then be rejected or accepted according to one's ultimate attitude to life. So he doesn't think that you can provide a justification to someone who doesn't already agree that science is valuable to convince them that it's valuable. Okay, he thinks that lies outside the realms of science. So you can provide a justification, but not using the means of science itself. So through all the sciences, and he runs through a series of examples here, rationalization of means to attain an end is what the science does. The importance of that end cannot be justified through this instrumental reason, many people will call it, through this reason that is aimed at technical solutions to how we should do stuff, but is not good at the why or the what we should do questions. And then he shifts registers and he starts talking about the role of the teacher, and this is because he has a perception that students are demanding something of their teachers who are training them in the sciences that both falls outside of what the teacher should be doing and is also kind of morally inappropriate for teachers to do, that they want leaders or prophets or gurus from their teachers, and he thinks this is bad for the teachers and for the students. And he'll unpack a little more of what he thinks science is in the course of talking about this. So he says, look, and this will be a distinction that's familiar to us from Kant from last week, you can step into the public sphere, he says, and you can debate political matters. There's nothing wrong with a professor or teacher doing that. But in the classroom, you need to be analytic. You need to present available positions, and you need to make it possible for students to take up their own position 
without forcing your views on them to the degree that that's possible. And he acknowledges in various ways that this can be very difficult and that there can be biases, but he holds the teacher responsible for a high degree of self-scrutiny about what they're doing in front of their students in the classroom and what kind of values they may or may not be imposing. He says, the prophet and the demagogue have no place at the lectern in the lecture hall. The message to both is go out on the streets and speak publicly, which is to say, go where criticism is possible. And again, this idea of the public sphere, that there is a place where you can go and have these debates because it is a freewheeling environment where reason attacks reason. But the lecture hall is not that kind of space. It is in Kant's terms a private space. And so you've got a particular role to perform as a teacher in that space. In the lecture hall, he says, the teacher sits facing an audience who are obliged to attend his lectures for the sake of their careers and remain silent while he speaks. I regard it as irresponsible if instead of giving his listeners the benefit of his knowledge and scientific experience, which is his duty, he takes advantage of a situation where there is no one who can criticize him and attempts to impose his political views on them. And then he notes, by the way, that while this is his very strong value and while he places great moral significance on it, he also can't demonstrate it scientifically. Uh, so he sticks within the spirit of that point. And then he asks, how are you supposed to do this? How are you supposed to not impose your views on your students when you may have students who just reject science at all? How do you, how do you walk that line? And so he starts by talking about religious students. And he says, presuppositionless science expects no less, but also no more, than the admission that if the process is to be explained without supernatural intervention, which must be discounted as causal factors for an empirical explanation, then it must be explained in the way science attempts to do. And it's quite possible for the believer to accept this without betraying his beliefs. So Weber says you can ask religious students to enter into a counterfactual kind of space and say, look, you're going to learn and we're going to assess whether, assuming there are no supernatural interventions, the scientific explanation is the best possible explanation for the thing, and you can judge scientific explanations according to whether they are. And then he talks about practical students, by which he means people who only want to learn applied skills and really think all of this is nonsense and, you know, uh, don't give us this theory. Uh, let's just stick to the facts. And he says, the first task of any competent teacher is to teach his students to acknowledge inconvenient facts, by which I mean facts that are inconvenient for his particular party viewpoint. And for every party viewpoint, even my own, for example, such extremely inconvenient facts exist. If the academic teacher can get his listeners to accept this, then I believe this is more than an intellectual achievement. I would be immodest enough to use the expression moral achievement. Okay, so there's a goal here to confront all students, whatever their positions, whether they agree with the teachers or not, with the arguments, the evidence that are awkward, are inconvenient for their beliefs, and give them exposure to confronting that. And he thinks that you can do those without it constituting an example of sort of forcing your beliefs on the students. And then he's got these great passages about value systems and how we choose between them, where, and this is an argument that we'll see followed through in other authors later in the term, this idea that science has disenchanted the world, it's chased away the gods, it's taken away the basis for the belief in a lot of supernatural things, but it's left us, oddly by doing this, not in a rational world where everything makes sense and is transparent and everyone agrees because we're all following reason. Instead, it leaves us in a world where we actually have no basis for making choices between value systems. And so we're back in a world, he says, that's very similar to the old superstitious world. We've still got dueling gods. It's just that our dueling gods are competing value systems where we don't have a basis for judging between them. So he says, the scientific justification of an opinion is impossible except when investigating the means of achieving a purpose that is accepted as a given. It is meaningless in principle because the various value systems in the world are in unresolvable conflict 
with each other with each other now not everybody's going to agree with this this is Habermas spends a great deal of his work criticizing Weber and arguing actually that there's a contradiction within Weber's work around this issue so that there are places in Weber's work where he suggests an awareness of how you could choose between value systems and Habermas is going to try to develop those into his own theory of how to do that but there are plenty of people who would also agree with Faber on this, and we'll see those play out in the coming weeks. So Faber says, here what we see is the perpetual conflict of different gods with each other. This is how it was in the ancient world before it was disenchanted with its gods and demons, only in a different sense. Depending on one's ultimate standpoint, for each individual, one is the devil and the other the god. The individual must decide which one is the god for him and which the devil. The many gods of antiquity, disenchanted and hence assuming the form of impersonal powers, rise up out of their graves, reach out for power over our lives, and begin their eternal struggle amongst themselves again. Okay? And we will see this imagery, particularly in theorists associated with what comes to be known as the Frankfurt School, people like Adorno and Horkheimer later in the term. We'll see people like Habermas really trying to argue against this. But this idea that the disenchanted world, which culminates in a kind of irrationality that wasn't expected at the beginning, so the expectation is you use reason, you get rid of the superstitions, what you get is a reasonable world that is transparent and where people will agree and where there will be peace and progress and prosperity, devolves actually into a world where we have every bit as much difficulty navigating our relations with each other, coming to agreement with each other, as we used to when we had the old supernatural beliefs. So having gone through that kind of very poetic interlude in the middle, he then says, okay, I'm talking to students who are trying to make a decision about what to go, whether to go into science. What does science actually offer? And he says, well, look, it, it has a lot of practical techniques for the calculated control over life. But he minimizes that because he says that's not really what we're talking about here. We're talking about science as a calling, as a vocation, as something where you're trying to decide whether to do it for its own sake rather than as something that is a good means to something else. He says it offers methods and tools for thinking, okay. It gives you the possibility of clarity. But then he says its primary value is that it provides assistance to the individual to give an account of the ultimate meaning of his own actions to himself. So within the context of this world where we have these dueling gods, science provides some possibility of working out the implications of commitment to the gods that you decide to worship at, to the value systems that you decide to adopt. He says, whether or not under such circumstances science is worthy to become a vocation, and whether or not it has a, an objectively worthwhile calling itself, is again a value judgment about which nothing can be said in the lecture hall, as an affirmative answer is presupposed if any teaching is to take place there. So if you're teaching, if you're operating as a scientist, which for favor is a broad category that includes what we would now call the sciences, the social sciences, and the humanities, if you're there at all, if you're teaching at all, you're already assuming that there's value to this enterprise, and the students in entering that space are entering a space where that's presupposed. But the scientific training itself can give them a basis for disentangling their own value systems and deciding how it's all going to fit together for them as individuals even if they leave that space as a result. And then he returns again to the issue of science as a profession, this specialized place that's going on in increasingly technical expert cultures. Science today is a profession practiced in specialist disciplines in the service of self-reflection and the knowledge of interrelated facts, and not a gift of grace, from visionaries and prophets offering revelation and the benefits of salvation. Nor is it a constituent part of the meditation of sages and philosophers on the meaning of the world. Okay? He says this because he thinks in earlier periods there was a connection between people who were involved in the progress of human knowledge and these more mystical spaces. And that connection's been severed through the course of time, through the development of science itself. 
He says, this is an undeniable fact of our historical situation, from which if we were to remain true to ourselves, we cannot escape. And if Tolstoy rises up in you once again and asks, who will answer since science does not, or in the language we've been using this evening, which of the warring gods shall we serve, then the answer is only a prophet or a savior. If there is none, then you will certainly not be able to force him to come to earth by getting thousands of professors in their lecture halls to try to usurp his role by acting like privileged or state-salaried petty prophets. Okay, so again, it's not the point of science as an enterprise or professors in the lecture hall to tell people the meaning of their individual lives, to direct their value systems, and he's making a strong stance about this, but they can provide a training that will enable people to make these decisions themselves. And then he talks a bit in the end about religion and theology, and it's sort of a strange way to end it. But again, it's driven by the issue of whether academic spaces might provide the locus for some kind of new theology or new prophecy that would bind communities together again. And he rejects it. He says that what you're going to get out of these spaces, and this isn't an abstract debate for him, there are academics at his time running around trying to do things like this, come up with sort of new religions and new systems of folk beliefs, and he says all this is going to do is generate fanaticism. It's not a genuine community, maybe outside the academy, but not within it. Okay, so he's presented his very specific view of science and of science's limitations.